Hello students of ancient history. This is our final content lecture and we will close out the Roman Empire today. And we have made our way from uh, the founding of Rome in, in uh, 753 and today we will close it out in 476 uh, with uh, the Emperor Romulus Augustulus. And this was uh, the period that really in the right at the turn of the uh, second century AD is a time of the the called the five good emperors and this recalls uh, the kind of emperorship the leadership that was under the emperor augustus and and really of good qualified able-bodied talented administrators and generals that had uh, followed in a line similar to augustus and uh, these five people were actually able to successfully uh, accomplish something that Augustus didn't, and that was a peaceful transition of power for a long period of time, almost a hundred years. Um, there's not a civil war following the death of an emperor, which had happened over most of the imperial, imperial uh, reigns following Augustus. So let us begin today with the five good emperors. And um, Really, Nerva is the first, but he's really a more of an honorary mention. The, the most important part of Nerva's reign is that he adopted Trajan as his son and uh, had him set up as emperor. And the really, one of, other than Augustus, probably Trajan could be or should be considered the, uh, the greatest emperor of Rome. And he was a very able-bodied uh, provincial uh, from Spain. And he was uh, a great general who distinguished himself in combat in... Uh, uh, along the, the frontier uh, in uh, Germania, or Germany, as, as well as in uh, the Dacia region. And he um, was a renowned general, renowned uh, person for his, uh, for his bravery and courage in battle, but also for his humility and his piety within the state. And uh, he famously enters Rome uh, walking on foot. He doesn't come in on his horse. He's not wearing his battle armor uh, like most of the people before him. He doesn't emphasize his great uh, conquest. Rather, he it comes in as a private citizen, much in the model of Augustus. Remember, Augustus would wear his toga. He would not look different than everyone else. He would not talk different than everyone else. Um, and like Augustus, Trajan refuses power when it is offered to him, but he eventually, of course, accepts it when he's asked many, many, many times, and he uses the old traditional Roman system. He uses the old assemblies, he, he uh, uses the Senate, he asks permission to do things rather than just simply declaring them as a, as a dictator or a, a military strongman, and he takes on the title again of princeps, uh, and he is the first emperor to take on the title of princeps uh, since uh, uh, really Augustus, uh, Tiberius I think uses print caps, but uh, it uh, it really is he doesn't care that much about it. But uh, uh, Trajan employs this, so he's he's very much in the model in the in the the ilk of uh, of Augustus. And there's a famous saying in later in the the Roman Empire after the death of Trajan that um, if you were wishing someone well, you would say, "May you be as lucky as Augustus." and as great as Trajan. So uh, this, uh, this embodies the two greatest emperors of Rome, and at the end of Trajan's life, uh, the Roman Empire will have, will have expanded to its greatest territorial extent um, that it ever will be. That uh, after this, there will never be, uh, Rome will never be larger territorially. And Trajan... Um, along with having some very important military conquests in Dacia, um, which is, is uh, right on the Black Sea and kind of the, the Balkans area of Europe, um, along with this, which he is a, through his wars in Dacia, is able to gain an enormous amount of wealth. He is able to gain an enormous amount of glory um, for Rome. And through this, he's able to pay for uh, many, many... Uh, infrastructure projects. He builds massive new road system, aqueducts, bridges, uh, constructs new market towns. He builds a brand new forum uh, within Rome itself. He builds a great harbor uh, out right outside of Rome at Ostia. And he also uses some of these funds to to uh, build much stronger border defenses along the Rhine and Danube uh, corridors. 
and uh, you can see this still to this day uh, commemorated within the the uh, Trajan's column in in uh, his own forum, which is uh, a uh, uh, depiction of all his deeds here in great circular form. It all goes. It's a, it's very tall, and um, along with these infrastructure projects, and uh, he also does many uh, administrative reforms. He creates these things called curates or curatores, um, which are just simply provincial officials that have a direct line of contact with the emperor himself. Uh, remember I said the bureaucracy that runs things when you have an emperor like a, a Nero or a Tiberius or uh, someone like this who doesn't really want to do much as emperor, um, the bureaucracy still kind of sees that the central administration is working. But when you have a very good emperor who wants to run things, he needs to sometimes bypass this uh, this this massive bureaucracy. Well, it really wasn't that massive, but bypass the, bio the bureaucracy. So he creates these new offices of, of curates uh, that are able to be very highly qualified uh, influence uh, or individuals in the provinces who who are able to institute the emperor's policies and let him know what is going on and and what uh, what needs to happen. So uh, Trajan goes into the east and he conquers uh, present day uh, Iraq, which is Mesopotamia, and um, has to deal with with uh, many problems in the east and this causes cost an enormous amount of money and he gains very little from this um, but uh, but nevertheless he is able to make his final conquest of Mesopotamia um, here between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers which was uh, always a, a life goal of his and they said uh, you know Trajan had never lost a battle uh, the only thing that could have ever defeated Trajan was of course old age and death so at the end of his life, he adopts uh, a very promising young man uh, to be his son and uh, declares him that he should be the next emperor. And indeed, he's, uh, he's uh, one of the, the best generals within Trajan's army, and uh, this is Hadrian. Hadrian, unlike Trajan, his forebearer and adopted father, uh, does not like the Senate. He doesn't like to do things in the same way that Trajan did, but nevertheless, he's still a very, very able uh, ad administrator, but he's a far more uh, authoritarian emperor than was Trajan. And uh, he expands the, the office of the curates uh, in order to strengthen his own personal and central power. And he does uh, many things. Uh, he, he, uh, he has infrastructure projects much like his predecessor, um, but he does something unheard of, which he pardons all public debts of all citizens of Rome, which made him obviously very popular. And he, like Trajan, adopts a son uh, that is a, a talented and gifted administrator and declares that he should be the next emperor. And not only does he do that, he forces this man, who is Antoninus Pius, um, to adopt Marcus Aurelius, who uh, is a, a very gifted, talented young man as well, to ensure a peaceful transition of power. Trajan, Hadrian saw the enormous problems that come from disputed successions. Um, so therefore, he wanted to ensure um, that there was a peaceful transition of power. And perhaps a, a dark spot on uh, Trajan's reign was uh, there was a massive Jewish revolt uh, around uh, uh, 132, and the Bar Kokhba revolt, and which means son of the star, and about half a million Jews are uh, are massacred, and uh, many are uh, thrown out of of uh, Israel, their native homeland, as well as their uh, their religion was made illegal. So there's always a lot of things said about uh, Christian persecutions, but also there is a massive Jewish persecution here. And Hadrian is, is famous for his incredible ability to uh, just uh, relentless uh, travel throughout the empire. Um, and he pulled back from many of the conquests of, uh, of Trajan before him because they were indefensible. So he, he pulls back the empire to the uh, the Rhine and Danube rivers in the north of of uh, of Europe here 
and he makes uh, very defensible boundaries. And uh, quite famously, in uh, in Britain, he builds Hadrian's Wall, named of course after Hadrian, in order to uh, be a, a borderland, a, a demarcation of the of the extent and end of the Roman Empire, but also a trade barrier and things like this. Um, much like the Great Wall of China, it's not only for defense, but there's many other uh, regions that it's built. And um, Hadrian is, is uh, um, a great builder like those before him. Antoninus Pius, after Trajan's death, um, takes over, and he is uh, he's not a military man. He's not interested in, uh, in con conquering anywhere or um, uh, doing a lot of expansion that his reign is one of simply peace and prosperity. He was, he was interested in building up the, uh, the economic surpluses of Rome, of, uh, of uh, having a very able and efficient administration, and he really dedicated much of his reign to, to uh, uh, religious policies as well. And he therefore, by not fighting a lot of wars, not becoming embroiled in a lot of things, of maintaining the boundaries that Hadrian had drawn, left a massive economic surplus for his, uh, his heir, Marcus Aurelius, who takes over. Um, and Marcus Aurelius is really a great, uh, they often refer to him as the philosopher emperor. And he really would have been a magnificent uh, professor or uh, a very talented philosopher. And he writes his... his um, his, his most famous work, the Meditations, when he's on uh, campaign uh, in, in Germania. And um, he's a, an extremely talented administrator. He's a good, uh, he's a good general. He's a good war leader. Um, but unfortunately, Marcus Aurelius gets bogged down in the north in these things called the Macromanic Wars. The Macromani are a Germanic tribe. Um, and um, he spends so much of his reign in the north that he's, he's uh, not necessarily able to accomplish all that he would have liked to do because of these wars. He spent so much time trying to conquer uh, Germany um, and so much of his resources there that uh, he, he neglects some other things. Um, but nevertheless, his, his reign was, uh, as it was a, a very decent one, and he was able to have some success um, in, in uh, moving things along. The only problem with Marcus Aurelius is that he, instead of adopting uh, Germanicus, who he should have adopted, uh, or Lucius Varus, uh, he, uh, yes, Lucius Varus, so he um, instead, at the end of his life, changes his mind and says, you know what, I'm going to make my son Commodus the emperor instead, because, well, he loved his son Commodus and he wanted to see him become emperor. Not because Commodus was qualified. And actually, early in his life, Commodus um, does not a terrible job. He's not a, a really great administrator, a good emperor, um, but he does an okay job of, of maintaining things. Um, and his problem is that he devol he just simply mentally kind of loses touch with reality. And he, he has this thing, you know, this, this really this megalomania. Um, and he tries to to um, style himself as these heroes of the ancient past and that he's going to refound Rome in the image of, of Romulus and rebuild the Republic. Um, and, uh, and he fights in gladiatorial games and, and, and these kinds of things. And he eventually um, is, is, uh, is in, in, in his, his life is really kind of a sad story. Um, but he just descends into madness, and he he uh, he ends his time within this madness, and he really served Rome very poorly, and and, uh, and just doesn't have a lot of success. And there are several other emperors that um, that come after Commodus that um, are pretty decent emperors. One is is uh, Septimius Severus, um, and w we just simply don't have a lot of time to go into this. But uh, we really see after Marcus Aurelius a collapse of imperial talent. And like I say, Septimius Severus is, a, is maybe a notable succep, uh, exception, or Aurelian, um, but um, after this, there's really going to be a collapse of uh, imperial 
standards and that they are going to devolve back into the days of civil war and generalissimos who march their troops into Rome for, for their own personal interests and things like that that, that uh, really are emperors that are not here to serve the state but rather to serve themselves. And, and there is one famous line here that uh, Septimius Severus tells his, uh, his son and he says, Love each other, speaking to father and son, Pay the legions well and trust no one. That this is what is coming uh, within the third century A.D. That um, it's a, it's a really cutthroat world. And here you can see the extent of the Severan Empire, which is named after Septimius Severus, the founder of the dynasty, who comes after Commodus. And uh, the Severans, other than Septimius, are really an unnotable lot. Um, they really are not uh, very successful. Actually, I think all of them are murdered by their own men uh, on in uh, in battle, and um, often, actually, the women of uh, the Severan dynasty do most of the running of political affairs because the emperors are so young um, that they cannot uh, they cannot rule in and of themselves. So uh, the, there's actually an instance here where women are are uh, are actually pulling the strings in Rome. So this leads us to the crisis of the 3rd century. And this is like the Roman period of the Roman Revolution or the Civil Wars, a time where there's really no centralized authority. There's massive civil wars led by generalissimos all over the place. Um, and uh, the empire is neglected because of the internal infighting. Um, the Senate really is, uh, is not able to do much, or the, the uh, assemblies in Rome, are, they cease to function in the same ways. Uh, and just these are just military strongmen who are running the show, who declare themselves emperors, their troops declare them emperor. Um, and along with this, we see barbarian coalitions. Now, before, before the, th the third century, um, Marcus Aurelius, for instance, goes up to fight the Macromani. He doesn't go to fight all of Germania. Um, but we began to see, starting in the 3rd century, large barbarian coalitions, uh, meaning that there are more than just one tribe, but these will become massive linguistic groups who unite uh, and move against Rome. And these are much more powerful, unified enemies than the sort of isolated tribal peoples um, that, um, that Rome had faced uh, before this, in the age of the five good emperors. And uh, the the historian Cassius Dio uh, famously said regarding the third century, he, he was a senator at the time, and he said, our empire turned from an age of gold to one of iron and rust, meaning that it was going to collapse. And there is the internal problems, and there were the external problems of the crisis of the third century. And you have 48 men... 48 emperors who wore the purple between 211 and 284. So this is on average of, uh, this is one person would be, be emperor, or the, there would be an emperor for about a year, maybe even a little, just a slightly longer than one year. So every time um, that there would be, uh, a year would go by, there would be a new emperor. So this is not uh, not very uh, a very good or auspicious thing. And um, of these 48 emperors between these years, um, only three of them were not murdered by their own troops. Um, and of them, uh, of those three, uh, one dies in battle and another dies of plague. And... This is often referred to as the, the time of the barracks emperors, meaning that there were just simply provincial generals who were emperors in their own barracks and they were never never made it to Rome or never actually really became a true emperor. There was no central government, that this was just simply no central authority, and these are just generals fighting each other. Um, also, when you have no centralized authority, the economy um, and taxation take enormous hits um, that the Roman economy just utterly collapses, the coinage falls to almost no value because they would uh, take all the precious metals out of the coinage, um, and they were in uh, the the uh, central administration was just simply not able to collect taxes, or that uh, the taxes that did uh, come in they were uh, uh, parceled off to other people through uh, corruption, and there was no ability to maintain security, to do business and have commerce uh, within within these uh, 
these warring factions within this t long period of civil war. And then, as I said, um, there were external problems, that there was a rise of a new and powerful enemy um, in, uh, in Persia. The, uh, the Sassanid uh, uh, Empire becomes uh, very powerful, and they are able to press into uh, Anatolia, or present-day Turkey, um, and, uh, and this is really the richest part of the Roman Empire, and it, it becomes uh, problematic, and the Romans have to somehow deal with this while dealing with the civil war. As well as, and uh, this is within the eastern half of the Roman Empire, in the western half of the Roman Empire, as I was saying, these large um, barbarian coalitions are building up and they are pressing in on the Roman Empire. And you can you can see here these various groups, which were the Franks, the Alemanni, right, all these Germanic uh, people are able to begin pressing in, and the Goths as well. Why are they pressing in, you should ask this. Why suddenly are they trying to cross the Danube and trying to cross the Rhine and come into Europe? Well, it is because of these other nomadic steppe peoples. If we remember long ago to our lectures that all these people that live out here on the great Asian steppes, um, they are beginning to push into the European heartland here. And when they uh, they are as scary to the Goths as the Goths are scary um, to the Romans. Um, so the Goths want to have some protection from this, so they want to cross over into the Roman Empire, and they want to become federati, right? They want to be uh, part of the Roman Empire. They want some imperial prote protection, but they also want the defensible boundaries of the Danube and Rhine rivers between them and these other um these other nomadic peoples that had come in uh, from from uh, the east. So um, the empire at this time is just simply fractured. That uh, there's effectively three Roman empires, uh, each one governed by its own barracks emperor. Uh, one that's run out of Gaul and Britain. One that is in sort of the central heartland here of uh, of of Italia. And uh, then one in the east, of course, as well. So, um, or, as I said, Aurelian, um, who is a, a very talented and able administrator, is able to kind of come in and restore um, order within the empire. But again, this is just a great general whose personal power is so great that he's able to kind of defeat his rivals. He's able to push out the barbarians, and he's able to kind of take over for as long as his heart beats. Um, but the moment he is dead, everything is going to descend right back into chaos. Um, and another example of this is Diocletian, who is a few emperors after Aurelian. Um, and Diocletian is, uh, he's going to totally attempt, or he's going to completely reform um, the imperial government, and this will be called something called the Domitiate, um, or uh, the Tetrarchy. And in this, he he tries to establish the emperor as being the fount of all authority and power. And uh, for the first time ever, a living emperor is called Lord and God. So Dominus et Deus is what uh, Diocletian liked to be called. And uh, uh, it really takes on the mantra of a, of a great and powerful godlike uh, emperor. And he famously institutes the, uh, the great persecution of Christians, and this is um, he, with the styling himself as a god, demanded emperor worship, and uh, to some degree uh, requires everyone to do this, and, and uh, the Christians uh, refuse to do this and uh, many of the Jews as well, and uh, therefore he institutes an empire-wide persecution of, uh, of uh, religious minorities. And uh, we won't go into all his administrative reforms, um, but I want to speak about his, uh, his governmental uh, reforms, and that is what is called the Tetrarchy, or the Rule of Four. And... What Diocletian envisaged was um, four emperors, and there would be two senior emperors that basically were in charge of uh, each half of the Roman Empire. So you would have an Augustus of the East, you would have an Augustus of the West, and then you would have two junior emperors, um, 
the Caesar of the West and the Caesar of the East. And when an Augustus retired or died, then the Caesar would take over for him and the Caesar would become the Augustus. And then the as Augustus, he would appoint another junior emperor for whichever side of the empire it was. Now, this system um, failed almost immediately because... What could uh, imagine? You can not. You could only imagine that if you pick four of the most powerful people in the empire and ask th ask them to all get along, share power, um, and uh, and then select their next successors. Well, immediately they simply fight each other instead. So as soon as Diocletian uh, retires, and Diocletian did retire, and he went to, to uh, set about his, his hobby of uh, harvesting cabbages, actually, um, that uh, all, all hell basically breaks loose, and all four of the, uh, the emperors are fighting each other. And it is uh, one of these, these uh, barracks emper emperors, uh, Constantine, or Constantine the Great, um, who... Yes, that is the Constantine that you are thinking of. Um, he is proclaimed emperor by his own troops, much like the barracks emperors of old, um, and he is able to march on Rome. He's able to defeat the armies of his rivals. He wins the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, um, and he is uh, makes himself uh, emperor of the West, and then eventually he is able to move east, and uh, conquer the eastern half of the empire, and where he refounds this great city of, of uh, Byzantium, and he calls it Constantinople, named after himself. Um, and uh, with this, he uh, the Edict of Milan he issues after his great victory at the uh, the uh, Milvian Bridge, in where he makes um, Christianity a legal religion within the empire, not the official religion of the empire, um, but simply. It is legal to practice Christianity among all other religions at this point. And then famously, he calls the Council of Nicaea to unite the church who he is going to use for his administrative purposes. So when he moves the capital over here to present-day Istanbul um, and renames it Constantinople after uh, the old Byzantine the Greek city, um, this is a major power shift that Rome, the city of Rome itself, is no longer the capital, but rather the focus of the empire now is on the eastern half of the empire, which is defensible, rich, urban. This is the half of the empire that you would pick. You would not want the stinking backwater of Gaul, uh, which is present-day France, or northern Italy, or Spain. Uh, this is not the area you would want to control because it is rural, it is uh, full of barbarians, it's indefensible, uh, and it's difficult to control, etc., etc. Um, but the East is much easier, and it's far richer, and the East long, the, the revenues and wealth of the East long propped up uh, the failing uh, western half of the Roman Empire. And as I said, Constantine, uh, I don't have time to go into um, his dealings with the church and, and uh, all his reforms and, uh, and the power of Christianity within the empire. If you wish to uh, hear about this, take my medieval history class and we will go over this in, uh, in nauseating detail. Um, but um, Christianity became the preeminent uh, religion of the empire in the 4th century AD and it spreads rapidly throughout the empire um, and, and uh, emperors from Constantine forward will use the Christian church who had uh, powerful and uh, well-trained officials uh, called bishops that uh, in everywhere throughout the empire and they would incorporate them within their uh, administration in order to uh, have able administrators with good networks throughout the empire. So we have looked at the, the, the uh, political developments within, so what is going on in the outside of the empire? So we have all these groups, 
um, that are coming in to the Roman Empire. Um, and the question is, there's a great historiographical question of are these invasions or are these simply migrations? And there's some argument to be made um, for both of these, but um, we see, as I said earlier, large nomadic coalitions of people such as the Huns um, who are putting pressure on the people who are living on right on the edge and the boundaries of the Roman Empire, um, who were themselves formerly nomadic peoples out of the Asian steppes. So they're, they, they come into the region of Hungary and Dacia, uh, and they settle there. And uh, then more uh, true nomadic peoples or more pure nomadic peoples um, come in, and then they begin to press... Uh, put pressure on uh, the the uh, settled peoples who were formerly nomads, and then these settled peoples want to move into um, the Roman Empire because they are terrified of this. Um, so we see the Goths uh, beginning to cross the Danube River, and you have the Ostrogoths and the Visigoths and, and all these kinds of people, and they want to become, again, I would stress, federati. They want to become um, part of the Roman Empire. They don't want to conquer or anything like that, um, but uh, they're often um, a, a very, they're, they're almost refugee status in, in some cases as they flee from, from these other uh, harsh nomadic peoples such as the Huns, um, and uh, the Romans treat them many times brutally, and therefore they simply rebel, and uh, one of the most famous battles uh, where a Roman emperor is killed and defeated by the uh, by the Goths is uh, at the Battle of Adrianople. And the important part of this battle is that it shows that the Roman Empire um, is no longer capable of defeating or effectively pushing barbarians out of um, Roman territory. That the barbarians at this point have become so numerous and so powerful um, that the, the Romans cannot, um, cannot indeed keep them out. So the emperor Theodosius um, sees the writing on the wall, and he creates this new kind of army, this new Roman army where he simply pays barbarians to fight in the army. Um, they, you don't have to be a Roman even any, anymore to fight in the Roman army. You simply are a conscripted mercenary. Uh, and this works actually very well for a time um, that the, uh, the native armies don't, uh, don't function. They don't have enough people. They can't put it together. So it's far more effective for an eastern emperor um, to pay off these barbarians to simply fight for him rather than him having to put together his own army. And this works well for the emperor Theodosius. And I would just simply note also that Theodosius, uh, he is the emperor, not Constantine, who makes Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire at this point. And this is, he also def divides the Roman Empire officially. It had kind of always been an unofficial uh, division from the time of Diocletian, but uh, Theodosius is really going to just go ahead and make this official. Um, that there's going to be an Eastern Roman Empire and there's going to be a Western Roman Empire, at least for administrative purposes. And um, the Western Roman Emperor will have to employ uh, barbarian military strongmen such as Stilicho or Stilico um, to govern their their uh, empire. That the the Western Roman Emperor has a lot of authority, but very little power. So he is forced to turn to these barbarian generals, these barbarian strongmen who, who desperately want um, um, commissions in the Roman military. Um, they want uh, the title of citizen. Um, they want these things that go along with being Roman, um, but they are, uh, they are not Romans in the proper sense. Um, and then these uh, these military strongmen would use their their uh, mercenaries and their their own uh, barbarian armies in order to fight Rome's battles to fight other barbarians. Um, and in 406, this, there is a massive 
of uh, migration of uh, Germanic peoples uh, and Gauls across the Rhine River um, because it was able to um, it, it, uh, it froze solid that winter and they were able to come across in, in massive numbers of possibly more than 200,000 um, at which point uh, Rome is sacked uh, very shortly after this because the, one of the emperors uh, is a, actually executes Stilicho um, for various crimes and there is no one then to stop this massive uh, uh, this massive migration of Germanic peoples into Rome and after Rome is sacked by, uh, by uh, Alaric the Goth um, that the Roman emperors are forced to move their capital to Ravenna which is a, a, northern, a city in northern Italy that's far more defensible um, than Rome is so at this point uh, Rome is, is really on, on the ropes here and this sack wasn't really uh, uh, an apocalyptic event um, but it was rather, again, Alaric wanted a commission. He wanted to be uh, a general in the Roman army. He was denied this, and therefore he marched on Rome and demanded his rights, much like Gaius Julius Caesar had done uh, many years before this. Um, so we see everywhere that the, the collapsing of Roman authority and in 406, to deal with, remember this invasion, or the, uh, when the, uh, all the Germanic 200,000 200, uh, Germans crossed the, uh, the Rhine River, uh, well, the last legionnaires in Britannia were recalled to protect Italy. And the Romans um, eventually, or the, the, uh, the Romano-British people, send an appeal. And they say, they ask the Roman Emperor for help. And the Roman Emperor eventually replies back to them after many years. He says, look to your own defenses. Look to your own defenses. No help is coming. And uh, supposedly this is where the, uh, the legend of King Arthur comes from. That's uh, when these Germanic peoples are beginning to cross over into Britain and invade um, the, the legendary hero... Um, called Arthur rises up and, and defeats the uh, the Saxon hosts, uh, these uh, Germanic peoples, the Saxons, um, in, a, in a crushing victory at the Battle of Baden Hill, and it, it stops their advance for 50 years. So we have seen uh, barbarians coming into the empire. Um, we have seen barbarians who want to be like Romans, um, but the real... Uh, terror of the of the empire are these great uh, nomadic peoples the Huns who who come crashing in to the empire um, and pressing barbarians in farther Attila the Hun uh, the leader of this great Hunnic coalition is uh, kind of commemorated here you can see this this rendering of him as this this absolutely uh, the scourge of God they called him uh, he drunk uh, uh, wine out of a human skull and and things like this but just these terrifying terrifying images to the uh, the Roman mind and um, one, again another barbarian who is employed by uh, the Emperor Valentinian the um, third Aetius is able, or he's uh, he's another barbaric uh, barbarian uh, chieftain who becomes a Roman, who is a general, who is the uh, uh, the master of horse for the Roman army, effectively Roman emperor in all but name. Um, he is raised among the Huns, um, and he is, is uh, tasked with driving the Huns out of of the Roman Empire by uh, Valentinian the Third, and he fights Attila. Uh, with his very excellent Roman army and his uh, Gallic uh, or his um, um, Goth mercenaries, uh, and he defeats Attila. And he could have killed Attila, but he chooses not to, for some reason or the other. He does. He chooses not to uh, annihilate Attila and the Hunnic host when he had the chance to do it. And for this, um, Valentinian executes Aetius. And this is the last um, um, straw of of uh, any hope within the the uh, Roman Empire for a military conquest because Aetius was kind of the last great Roman commander who was able to marshal the legions and there's a very famous story that after the execution of Aetius of course Attila comes back the very next year and um, 
the Pope, Pope Leo the Great, um, marches out um, with no army, and he just simply alone goes and speaks to Attila, and he convinces Attila through argument or, or uh, through some means. We have we have no idea what he said, but he convinces Attila to turn around um, and leave and not to uh, not to sack Rome. So this is a great story of a of a pope of a, a leader of the church who is uh, having to act as an emperor, um, as they will come to do later um, with the fall of the Roman Empire, um, but taking on the uh, political and administrative authority of the secular state. So the fall of Rome comes, uh, we uh, officially date this to 476, uh, as the, the, the reign of Romulus Augustulus, um, when he just simply is deposed off the throne um, by Odovacar, the, the barbarian, the uh, Ostrogoth, and uh, he just simply tells Romulus, uh, you're no longer needed, um, please leave. <laughs> and uh, so it, this so passes the Roman Empire into legend in 476. So it started with a Romulus in 753, and it ends with a Romulus, at least in the West, um, in, uh, in 476. And uh, the Eastern Roman Empire goes on to continue and thrive up until uh, 1453 with the, uh, the, the, as the Ottoman Turks uh, defeat uh, uh, Constantinople almost a thousand years after this. Um, but f for the Western half of the Roman Empire, this is, this is really it. Um, and again, Odovacar um, does not want to be emperor. He just wants to be a general. And you can see this again and again and again that... Uh, these uh, these barbarian coalitions that they want Roman things they would have thought of themselves as being Roman federati or uh, you know as as being this kind of uh, uh, second class Roman citizen but they wanted to be Roman generals they wanted to participate within this Roman state um, and by doing so and by uh, marching on Rome time and time again to uh, gain their their positions that they wanted they uh, they simply pushed out and destroyed any vestiges of Rome. The Senate in Rome will continue to operate until uh, the 7th century, uh, but with really no authority outside of the city of Rome itself. Um, but uh, uh, it, is, uh, it is interesting that um, both internal and external forces played an enormous part on the collapse of the Western Roman Empire, but Roman civilization is, uh, is uh, preserved in the East. And they would have argued that it never did fall, that the, uh, the Roman emperors uh, were still functioning and doing the same things that they were doing um, in the year 1000 or 1200 as they had been doing um, in uh, the year 100. And, and uh, so did Rome really fall in 476? I think this is a great historiographical question and one that I will leave you to ponder on. And following the collapse of the West, this is really what uh, the... the uh, the world looked like after the collapse in uh, 476 that you began to see the, the uh, creation of these new uh, barbarian states. You will see here Spain and France and Germany and Italia. Uh, and then you will see the Byzantine Empire here in the West. Um, you'll see England, Scotland. Um, all of these people, uh, this is it really starting to look more like uh, the, the modern day Europe that, that, we, uh, that we know. So this, Students of Ancient History, is uh, the conclusion of our lectures. And I hope that you have come to appreciate the ancient world and you have come to see that it is worth studying. And how these great political, internal, and religious developments came to, uh, to drive change and to transform these human societies all the way back from the time of the ancient Mesopotamians um, up until the time of Rome. That how things were transformed, um, what cultural and social factors that are preserved within the historical record, um, and how that human society has continually developed, changed, uh, and uh, transformed uh, throughout its, its long history from uh, evolution uh, until uh, the time at the end of the Roman Empire. So if you wish to continue on this journey, you are very uh, welcome to take or uh, watch my, uh, 
medieval history class where we will pick up with uh, about the reign of Constantine uh, and we will carry on until the, uh, the Protestant uh, Reformation in 1500. So thanks for watching. Stay healthy, wealthy, and wise.